we're really delighted to have you all joining us. We're really excited about our panelists. We have amazing people to, to speak with today and for you to talk to. Uh, before we get started, and we're really delighted to have our, our participants as well online with us, so thank you for joining in. Uh, as we begin the webinar, I'd like to uh, start off by sharing a land acknowledgement. Uh, Laurier's Waterloo and Brantford campuses are located on the shared traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. This land is part of the Dish with One Spoon Treaty be between the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe peoples and symbolizes the agreement to share, protect our resources and not engage in conflict. From the Haldeman Proclamation of October 1784, this territory is described as six miles deep from each side of the Grand River, beginning at Lake Erie and extending in the proportion to the head of said river, which them and their posterity are to enjoy forever. The proclamation was signed by the British with their allies, the Six Nations, after the American Revolution. Despite being the largest reserve demographically in Canada, those nations now reside on less than 5% of this original territory. I also invite you to consider the land where you are and its Indigenous peoples as we begin this webinar. Just to give you a sense of how the webinar will unfold, uh, we will have about 20 minutes for our panelists uh, to introduce themselves and provide some context for their comments. We'll then follow that up with about 40 minutes uh, for panel discussion and 30 minutes for uh, question and answer from you, the audience. Uh, my name is Alison Blay Palmer, and I'm a professor in geography and environmental studies at Wilfrid Laurier University, where I hold the UNESCO chair on food biodiversity and sustainability studies. And I'm also the director of the Laurier Center for Sustainable Food Systems. So why are we doing this webinar? Well, it occurred to us that we're now more than 30 years out um, from the Earth Summit that was also known as the United Nations Conference on Environment and Development or the Rio Conference. And we thought that this was a really good opportunity to mark that occasion um, and also to reflect on the changes uh, that have happened since that conference. Uh, it was held in Rio de Janeiro in June of 1992. And the key reason for the Earth Summit was created um, so the United Nations members could cooperate on issues around sustainability as it was recognized that this challenge was well beyond the scope and borders of individual member states and collaboration was needed to realize the goals that we needed to enact to achieve sustainability. Uh, so the Earth Summit was really intended to be a collaboration platform and uh, a step in achieving uh, our sustainability, our collective sustainability goals. Some of the key achievements of the summit were, first of all, the Rio Declar Declaration sorry, <laughs> on Environment and Development, Agenda 21, and the Forest Principles. The legally binding agreements, uh, or the Rio Conventions, were open for signatures, and these include the Convention on Biodiversity, on Biological Diversity, sorry, uh, the Framework on the Convention on Climate Change. And it was also agreed um, at an international negotiating committee would be struck for a third convention on the um, to combat desertification. And that this would be uh, what that was committed to at the Rio meetings. Now, a lot has happened since 1992, obviously. Um, through the UNESCO chair, we work uh, through food systems and sustainability towards green, healthy, fair, and localized food systems. That's our, our driving goal. And it's really our North Star for all the work that we do. Um, so as a result of our focus on sustainability, we were interested in organizing this panel um, to really explore uh, recent questions and the work that can arise from them. So some of the thing, themes that we think are particularly relevant are the movement towards what we see as a more systems-based approach. Um, so we're able now to appreciate more multifunctional benefits in addressing these complex or wicked uh, challenges that the world is facing. We also see that although we're very far from achieving where we would like to be, there's a greater engagement with um, Indigenous peoples and local communities. So for example, if you look at the recently negotiated global biodiversity framework, there are several targets that engage directly um, with IPLCs and also um, there have been many calls since the meeting wrapped up in, in uh, December for those 
communities to be, be engaged in implementing the global biodiversity framework. And of course, as Magdalena is going to uh, is going to speak to um, the Committee on World Food Security has uh, a mechanism that's focused on Indigenous peoples and local communities, and that's um, uh, Magdalena is very well poised to speak to to that um, as an important consideration. There's also um, what I would characterize as the move to a more regional or territorial focus um, in terms of interventions. So I think that we're starting to identify how to scale the transformation that's needed uh, in terms of how we resolve these problems. I think we're recognizing that the action needs to happen at the territorial regional scale and that this needs to be coordinated um, with uh, interventions at the global scale that support those um, interventions that are lower down um, in terms of governance. So these are some of the places where change can happen. Um, on the other hand, uh, we are facing increasing corporate concentration and financialization across the board. Um, and one of the effects of this is to monetize nature. So um, we have debates, raging debates about things like nature-based solutions versus ecosystem approaches and the language and the characterization of solutions that comes with those different framings. We also see the need for increased attention to human rights and the need for more multilateral agreements that are uh, state-led as, as opposed to corporate-driven and led. So with all of that as sort of a context and background for the center and for the UNESCO chair and why we are really excited to be um, to be holding this panel, um, I'm going to now introduce everybody to you. Uh, first, uh, Robert McClemon is going to draw on his experience from Canadian diplomatic missions in Belgrade, Hong Kong, New Delhi, Seattle, and Vienna. His work as a professor in environmental studies at Laurier and his time as a lead author for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change to provide his perspectives on migration, health, and climate change. Miriam Medel Garcia, as Chief of Global Policy Advocacy and Regional Cooperation for the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification, and a mixed Mexican diplomat and former special assistant to the Executive Secretary of the UN Framework uh, to Combat Climate Change will share her thoughts on climate change, land tenure, and sustainable development. And Magdalena Ackerman is a policy and advocacy officer for food systems, nutrition, and agroecology for the Society for International Development and a participant on the Committee on World Food Security. She brings insights on food security, land tenure, gender, and the right to food and nutrition to the panel. So welcome, everybody. We are so delighted to have you with us. Thank you for making time. And uh, I'm going to turn over um, the mic, as it were, if we were live, <laughs> to Robert to, uh, to kick things off. So uh, over to you, Robert. Thanks so much, Allison. And uh, just give me a thumbs down if you can't hear me, folks. Uh, but otherwise, uh, thank you. Uh, I am in Salem, Ma Salem Massachusetts today uh, and in the midst of a what they call a nor'easter, a really bad storm. And so it's kind of like what's that that word in, in English uh, or in literature where nature echoes sort of, you know, the mood. Is it pathetic fallacy or something like that? Or anyhow, there's storms outside my window. And I think uh, Allison's uh, intro set us up quite nicely that, you know, there's there's storms in the uh, the the international negotiations over nature and the crises we face in terms of food security and climate change and so on. Anyhow, uh, let me give you a little backdrop. I am old enough to remember 1992 quite well. Uh, and uh, of the three major conventions that came out of the Rio uh, summit, the UNFCCC, that's the climate change one, the uh, Co Convention to Combat Desertification and the Biodiversity ones, I've been most actively involved professionally with the Climate Change Convention i uh, done a little bit of work in the past for the uh, Convention to Combat Desertification in terms of uh, how land degradation, desertification can stimulate uh, displacement of people from their, their traditional lands. Not so much on the biodiversity side in terms of formal things, but I do teach uh, environmental studies and we focus a lot on biodiversity. I think one place to start, oh, and I've been involved with the IPCC, which actually predates the Rio Convention by a couple of years as well, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. But I think it's good to start with a little historical context. The, the Rio Summit did not just emerge out of nothing. Uh, it, it was actually sort of uh, the peak moment, I think you could say, in the late 20th century uh, in terms of international community coming together collectively 
constructively to address some of the great environmental challenges of the time. And its predecessor, there was a number of different UN conventions going back to the early 70s, but the 1987 one, the World uh, Commission on Environment and Development, uh, the Brundtland Commission is often known, uh, issued a report in 19, 1987 called Our Common Future. And that really laid the groundwork for the 1992 um, the 1992 Rio uh, summit. And we all know from the, the our common future that you know the de definition of sustainable development and sustainability is making sure that we protect resources, that we use them wisely and make sure that we're conserving uh, resources for future generations to enjoy as well. And we think about social, economic and environmental progress when we're talking about sustainability and not simply environment uh, economic growth. Uh, also happening in the years leading up to um, to Rio was that the the end of the Cold War. So perestroika and glasnost in the Soviet Union, beginning in the late eighties, the, the the fall of the Berlin Wall in nineteen eighty nine. I think in in the West, in Western countries, and at this time I was working for the uh, the Canadian government as a foreign service officer, starting in nineteen ninety. There was this sort of exhale as all these decades of nuclear confrontation between East and West, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, the Soviet Union and the NATO allies. Everyone exhaled and said, OK, that's over. Now we can sort of turn our attention to other things, other challenges. Uh, and so it was a time of optimism in countries like Canada. Uh, and uh, it, but around the world, it had a diff that era was a little bit different. So, for example, I was in Hong Kong in 1992. Uh, and at that time is when China was opening up in terms of its, econ uh, its economy and its relationship with the West as well. Rapid economic growth. Same in India, rapid economic growth. Um, and so there was reason for optimism on one hand, but there was also reason for pessimism. You'll recall in 1990, uh, Iraq invaded Kuwait. There was the Rwanda genocides at that time. Yugoslavia started to unravel in 1992, and you know, much of the 1990s was dominated by that conflict. There was the Tiananmen Square massacres in Beijing. So it was one of these, is the glass half full, half empty time in world history. Um, and so Rio 92 was a real opportunity for the world to come together. And one thing I'd like to highlight, and this is important as we go into our discussion later, is that if you think about who were the leaders of Canada, the United States, and the UK at that time, I'm not sure if anybody needs to Google those or not, but they were all conservatives. They were all right-wing politicians. So the first George Bush in the United States, Brian Mulroney uh, in Canada, and John Major uh, in the UK. So it was a time when even on the right wing, if you will, people were concerned about environmental well-being. Um, there's also a couple of things I wanted to mention is that in the 1980s, we had these terrible droughts and famines in uh, in sub-Saharan Africa in particular, but earlier in the decade in other parts of the world as well. And you'll recall in the 1980s, you know, pop stars and musicians coming together to have concerts to uh, to, to, to help save the world, feed the world, and so on. So there was this emotion, this sort of um, momentum, if you will, collectively within civil society and politicians to work towards a, a cleaner, better environment. And I think it was underpinned by uh, the fact that NASA scientists were warning that climate change was a real thing, that we were starting to, to enter into this world where we were disrupting the very functioning of the, the globe's ecosystems itself. And I'm a little bit young to remember... I don't remember moon landings and things like that, but people 10 years older from than me, you know, uh, and the folks who were at the negotiating table in um, in Rio, they remembered the moon landings and the space race, and they put a lot of stock in what scientists had to say. Another thing that today we're kind of skeptical about science, aren't we, in the popular world? So all these things sort of came together nicely in 1992. And so I'm just going to wrap up my little five-minute intro by saying just for me personally, um, I think that uh, we're still in a is the glass half full or half empty kind of moment. If you think about the processes that came out of uh, Rio 92, many of them are still going on. We still have these annual climate change uh, meetings to try and advance greenhouse gas emissions reductions. And that in itself is an achievement and an accomplishment. There are so many other global challenges where we fail to get adversarial countries around the table to talk collectively and constructively about solving problems. So many things we could think about where it's, it's everyone's at loggerheads. So the process is the fact that they endure, I think is an achievement. I think the glass half empty is that they move too slowly to really address the real challenges that we face today. So I'll leave my comments at that and turn it over to the next speaker and give them a chance. Thank you. 
Thanks, Robert, for that framing. That was an ideal uh, way to, to kick things off. And um, thanks for reminding us all about those really important milestones and challenges. Um, if uh, Miriam, if you're ready to uh, take the floor, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alison. And first of all, uh, very happy to be here. I think it's very, I don't often see a, a seminar or a conversation to discuss the importance of the synergistic implementation of the three real conventions. Um, and I think that is a big missing uh, element of the global conversation on sustainability. Uh, because of what I'm about to say. So, um, and I very much also appreciate Robert's uh, remarks on the genesis of it all and on the, and, and also on his positive outlook on the annual uh, COP, climate change COP, because um, one also can see the negative and, 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 and get very frustrated and think, oh, well, this is, these people are meeting, have been meeting for, 30 years, 30 something years, um, well, 28 years actually, uh, what, what are they doing? Anyway, uh, I think it's also important that I introduce my convention. I, I work for the United Nations Convention to Combat the Certification. It is one of the three conventions, although it was not formally adopted until two years after the other two. So it was already born a little bit later and it is often referred as the little sister of the three Rio conventions, it's definitely the one with the smallest institutional framework. And uh, also one, the one I would say with the most targeted uh, objective, which is which has to do with combating the certification, land degradation and drought. And specifically for many years, it was very much also considered as an African convention uh, in its name, in its official title. It, it, it does speak to that, to combat the certification, land degradation and drought in affected countries and specifically in Africa. And there's a lot of history about that. However, the, the UNCCD, as we refer to it, has, as climate change and as biodiversity, 197 countries. And it has in its objective a very, very precise mandate, which is to help the parties, the 197 members, to manage sustainably their land and water resources. So now, if we go into uh, what does it mean? What does that mean for sustainability, but also for the 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 the, the continuation of 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 our lifestyle and of livelihoods uh, in the next uh, decades? Well, it is basically about restoring, preserving, conserving the source of ninety nine percent of our calories and the source of ninety nine percent of our resources, of materials that, that humans require to build or do multiple things. So it is actually a very crucial convention that I, I do see now that it is getting a lot of traction. Um, its relationship to climate change and to biodiversity conservation is also very obvious. So it, because it's about land and about water uh, so and, and about uh, terrestrial ecosystems. So we in our in our jargon we we consider land to be the operational link between climate um and humans between climate and biodiversity and then it is also very ed evident for us that the linkages between land degradation climate change and biodiversity loss are quite are there are quite evident they have been established by uh, the scientific bodies of the three the three Rio conventions. I mean, Robert probably remembers from the IPCC. The IPCC has a report on land and on the importance of land for climate change mitigation uh, as capturing carbon, but also what is happening to the climate because of degraded lands, because it all becomes a very terrible vicious circle. So the, the vicious circle has been established. Uh, the good news is that the opposite is also true. So um, land restoration initiatives have a positive impact for climate, for climate change mitigation and adaptation, as I said, because they, you restore the, the, the ability of the land to capture carbon, you restore ecosystems, you, you conserve uh, species, biodiversity, um, and then you have the self-fulfilling virtue cycle. In, the, in all of this, uh, I would say that I do remember Rio, uh, I was very young, but I do remember it. And I, now that I work on these issues, what strikes me is 
the wisdom of these people, of our predecessors, to have these three issues linked together or coming out together from this conference. And now with the Paris Agreement, which came in 2015, and the Sustainable Development Goals, which also came in 2015, we have this very, very clear blueprint to basically solve the mess that we have created as humans and the unbalance with nature that we have created. So we have the blueprint. Now it, it is about implementation. And it is, I also like the remark that you made at the beginning, Alison, on, on, on regional and local implementation of the conventions. We have negotiated a lot. There is um, a space and a reason for the conventions to meet. Climate change meets every year. A biodiversity and, and the certification meet every two years, and then they develop, they continue to develop the regime, the framework that helps countries uh, draw to, to, to turn those, those agreements into national action. Right now, uh, for example, in the UNCCD, we have a working group on drought, which is very intensely trying to determine what, what is next for the UNCCD about drought resilience and dealing with drought as exacerbated by climate change. So um, there, of course, there is a reason for these meetings, but at the end of the day, what we need is implementation on the ground. The blueprint is there and uh, we need everybody, starting with national governments, multilateral institutions, donors, uh, multilateral development banks, the facilities for the conventions, the Global Environmental Facility, the Green Climate Fund, everybody to chip in, but then turn it, really distill it into local level action. I will end with the, with my last point on land tenure. We are very fortunate enough in, um, in UNCCD that our parties decided to adopt in 2019, a decision on land tenure and the importance of secure land tenure for a successful land restoration um, projects. So when people feel that they are that they have secure access to the resource that they are working, they are definitely more prone to take care of it, to contribute, to make the best of it. Um, I would go one step further. The, the recently adopted Global Biodiversity Framework also recognizes that based on the work from the UNCCD. So it also, the, the three conventions also feed on each other. And we are expecting that same conversation related to climate change because a very high percentage, 60% of the, of the emissions from many, many countries come from the land use sector and from food, uh, from food production and, 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 and land, land utilization. So, we are really looking forward to work with uh, parties, with local communities, with women's grassroots organizations, uh, because they are the ones who are always working the land to see how we can advance the land tenure agenda. And perhaps, perhaps the next evolution will be to bring the two together, the, the sustainable development agenda together with the human rights agenda as one uh, in the very little time that we have left between now and, and 2030. So I leave it there, and I am very happy to to continue com uh, talking to you in the next of uh, in the next forty minutes, or I don't know how much time we have left. Thank you. Thank you so much, Miriam. That was a great um, introduction to the work, the the really important work that you're involved in, and the relevance of especially land as the foundation really for everything that people do in terms of food and materials for life for our lives and and all of those important factors and you also provided an excellent segue for Magdalena <laughs> so Magdalena I will turn the floor over to you for your comments now yes thank you so much Alison and thank you Miriam and, and Robert for uh yeah your key opening words um I think my connection is not very stable today so in case uh you lose me please uh, let me know maybe via chat but I hope I can stay connected um so yeah um Alison you mentioned uh, and also Miriam the the new global biodiversity framework and I wanted to open also with with that no and especially what you mentioned Alison on the recognition um of um focusing on indigenous peoples and and local communities for uh, the conservation and the protection of, of biodiversity. In fact, uh, this uh, 
is uh, a crucial step forward um, in this new uh, framework of uh, the CBD. Um, because mostly it, it recognizes not the central uh, role that uh, indigenous peoples, and uh, I would say here also more broadly, the, the role and the agency of, of food producers that they have in, in seeing uh, the, the health of, of the earth, of the planet, as not separated from the health of, of ourselves, no, of human beings. Um, and and the, the recognition of indigenous peoples uh, in this framework, but also uh, throughout the, the UN uh, fora, um, has been uh, an advance uh, in this in these years, particularly given the um, the work no, of of social movements of civil society and the participation uh, throughout these uh, different UN fora. And um, specifically this, uh, this global, uh, this new framework uh, comes uh, two years after uh, the ratification also of the UN declaration on the rights of, of peasant and um, people working uh, in rural areas, uh, in rural areas, which is also, a significant uh, step forward uh, across the UN system and uh, in international human rights law uh, to recognize peasants as uh, central agents uh, in the well-beings of communities, but also uh, in national economies um, and uh, they recognize their identity. No? Um, so I just wanted to start uh, with maybe this, these two, um, let's say, step forwards in the past years to open up uh, to also the, the role that um, the UN Committee on Food, um, on food Security and Nutrition has had uh, since its reform in 2009 um, in terms of, of global food governance. And um, I, I speak mostly about uh, food governance uh, because, well, this is the area I have been focusing on for the past four years, but uh, it is also coming from an understanding that food cannot be separated and cannot be understood uh, as uh, separated from uh, our health from the well-being of, of our planet, uh, from the, 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 the climate, uh, from the well-being also of, of land. Um, so a food, as you mentioned, uh, Alison, gives um, a good entry point to have this systemic uh, approach to uh, the crisis we are facing. And unfortunately, uh, I don't have such an optimistic reading uh, at this point in time because the crisis is getting worse. We are seeing layers uh, of, of food crisis being added, uh, particularly in the past uh, 15 years. Uh, so we have had three food uh, price crises uh, over the 15 years and uh, from the civil society and particularly the food justice movement, we understand this not as um, in uh, unrelated crisis, but rather as as multiple layers uh, that have been um, built because of a more structural issue, a more systemic problem that we are facing. Uh, so having this systemic and structural understanding of the crisis opens up the door to also uh, understand what are the changes needed and which the kind of discussions need to take place uh, also at the global level. Um, because yes, transformation uh, can happen at the local, uh, national, territorial level, but if the global community and the international agreements do not support uh, the transformations occurring at the local level, well, uh, it is very also hard to advance on this transformation. Uh, so a systemic uh, understanding is, is needed to, 
to also challenge no, uh, the, the, the model that uh, is currently um, uh, shaping our economies and particularly our food systems. Um, uh, in particularly, uh, we have been seeing as, I won't go too much into details on the structural issues, uh, but, uh, just to highlight uh, some of them, uh, we have been seeing an increased dependency, particularly from the countries of Global South on food import. Uh, also, uh, indebtedness of countries, no, uh, reducing their capacities to uh, lay out public policies that support the transformation needed of, of food dependencies. As you mentioned also, Alison, the increase uh, concentration of, of corporate power uh, in food systems and um, and the advance also of of, of corporations at uh, the the international level um, at the detriment always of uh, the communities at the national level because many of uh, these advances are in the name of uh, continuing development, uh, a model that is the industrial agri-food uh, model uh, that actually uh, disrupts the relationship uh, between uh, communities and the nature, and particularly has uh, had uh, several impacts uh, on uh, food producers, on their rights, uh, and particularly in terms of, of land grabbing, for instance, no, um, and the realization of the, their right to food. Um, so these these systemic issues that that we have seen are um, often not so much addressed uh, in the international fora on or when there is an attempt. Uh, it is very hard to continue. And the CFS, so the UN Committee on World Food Security, provides a space where these discussions can happen as so as to ensure a coordination between uh, global policies, uh, not only related to food, but also biodiversity, which is so central not to the, the health uh, of, of people and the production of, of food. Um, so the coordination of policies to support the transformation of, uh, of food systems at the local level. So um, from, from the, the CSIPM, uh, which is the, the civil society and indigenous peoples uh, mechanisms for relations to the UN Committee on World Food Security, uh, we have had um, uh, several consultations, uh, regional popular consultations, over the past years, um, particularly uh, during 2020 when the pandemic um, uh, started, but also last year uh, in response uh, to the disruptions in food systems uh, caused by the, the war in Ukraine. And these consultations have uh, helped us um, gather the experiences that uh, local communities and small scale food producers are, are facing at the territorial level, which challenges they, they, they are facing, which responses they have put forward, uh, mostly in cases where governments were unable to, to respond to the crisis. And also these people have played an essential role in continuing with uh, the realization of the right to food of communities uh, when government uh, responses were absent. So we have gathered these experiences and we have also gathered the demands and uh, those demands are the ones I have mentioned uh, first. Um, Magdalena, I you are giving us the, an excellent um, link to our next uh, set of questions. And I'm very grateful to you for providing so much context. Um, but if it's okay with you, maybe what we'll do is get the, the conversation started. Um, thank you so much for laying the groundwork, all of you for um, 
thinking about what um, what Magdalena has just been talking about, about these kinds of consultations that have happened with Indigenous peoples and local communities through the CFS, uh, the um, the CSI, CF, sorry, <laughs> the um, Civil Society and Indigenous Peoples Mechanism of the CFS. Um, and what I would like to do is ask each of you, uh, maybe we'll start um, this time with um, Miriam and then go to Robert and then um, to Magdalena. If you have some examples of success, what, you, what we could consider relative success, and we understand that success in these contexts is a contingent thing, things are so complicated. Um, but maybe if you could give us an example or two uh, that you're familiar with that would allow people to understand how this change is possible um, and what that would look like on the ground. And, um, and then I'm gonna call on you in the next round of questions to reflect on how that could be linked to the international realm and the types of conventions that we've been talking about. So Miriam, if you could get us started, that would be great. Um, thank you very much. I mean, I can think of a few a few examples um, uh, of the importance of in of the interlinkage between or the participation, I would say, between local, regional, national level, and then everything under the framework. The first one would be um, the Great Green Wall uh, a project for the Sahel. It is still a very controversial, uh, a very controversial um, issue because it was born in 2007 with the idea to rehabilitate this land that goes across the Sahara. So the 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 the, the, the ecosystem, uh, uh, the dry land that go that that crosses the Sahara Desert that was becoming also, that was become turning into a desert that was a, a, a suffering a, a lot of desertification so while and i would call it a success because over these uh, more than a, a little bit over 10 years what has happened is that the original goals of rehabilitating the whole land the, across 11 countries uh, haven't I mean, the original goals haven't been achieved. However, there is a realization, a very, very striking realization from everyone, from the community, from the local governments, from the different groups that live in that in that in that area, from the multilateral multilateral donors, the international community. I mean, it's very easy to figure out that France, for example, has a lot of interest in that region for obvious historical reasons. So. In this time, in this 10, a little bit, 13, 14 years, there is a very striking realization that nothing will be possible without the full participation and the and listening to the voice of the local communities. So whatever that is agreed has to pass through the filter of the local and has to be adapted to the local. So up to now, um, I will look up, I, I don't have the exact number of how many hectares have been rehabilitated, but it is actually a very high number already to, uh, I think it's close to over 200 hectares. Um, I, I'll look it up um, and then put it in the chat. Uh, but also benefiting, creating jobs for the community and actually preventing migration from that area to other areas, which is a little bit what Robert was, was referring to earlier. And with, a, with an impact also in peace and security, because we also know that this region of the world is known for some turmoil, some civil turmoil. So to me, the Great Green Wall is a success because I think it can be, and right now there's a lot of pledges from many, many donors to continue with the project, to really rehabilitate the whole area, um, to make it green again. It was, it was always a very green, uh, uh, thriving area, uh, regard, I mean, despite of the fact that it's by the desert, close to the desert. And um, to me, it's a success because it shows the rest of the world that this is the type of project that we need to be implementing. I think I am from Mexico. So I think of the Central American Dry Corridor and I can see many, many, many um, similarities and many possibilities for that dry corridor to become the great green wall of the of the of the Americas, for example. Thank you. 
Thank you, Miriam. That's a fantastic example. And it really speaks to um, how we can connect uh, the local communities up to global uh, initiatives in a really positive and impactful way. So, Robert, um, over to you. Sure. Okay. And uh, I will pick up on uh, Miriam's intervention by adding some suggested bright spots on the horizon in terms of climate change and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And I'll pick up on uh, technological and economic uh, advances, governance advances, and civil society uh, as well. So in terms of the technical side of things, we're at a moment in time where it's possible to generate energy uh, more cheaply using non-fossil fuel technologies than using fossil fuels on a dollar per watt of energy production. And this is the first moment in time, just the last couple of years or so, where that existed. At the time, the 1992 convention was signed on climate change, solar panels existed, wind turbines existed, hydroelectric power existed, and so on. But it was still cheaper to burn coal, to burn natural gas, to burn oil and gasoline. Not anymore. Today, we're at that point where economically we can make that transition. So the excuse that the economic disruption would be too great, that's gone now. So we have that opportunity. On the governance side of things, we actually have Western governments who, you know, since 1992 have been willing to agree to anything when it comes to the environment. That's not the problem. It's the action to follow up on those agreements that has always been lagging behind. But now we actually have governments in Canada and the United States, for example, and in the European Union that are putting money behind these commitments. So here in Canada, we have ambitious targets for reducing Canada's greenhouse gas emissions. And just last July, the government announced some very uh, uh, widespread measures to try and achieve those in the United States. It's called the Inflation Reduction Act, but it's actually an environmental uh, uh, bill uh, that was passed by the Biden administration to put money into green technologies and so on. So we're trying to actually follow through on these commitments. And then the third thing is civil society. And we can look at Greta Thunberg um, and the fact that young people today are more active than ever in trying to push governments, industry and others to actually take these concrete actions. They're active, they're engaged. And social media uh, is providing them with tools to influence policymakers as well. And just finally, a little plug for the things that Allison and I teach, uh, enrollment in uh, university and college programs related to the environment has skyrocketed over the last decade. So not only are young people engaged with the debate, they are now equipping themselves with the tools that they need to actually make real uh, real change in a practical sense as well. So there's some bright spots, if if I might. Thank you very much for those bright spots, Robert. We need to um, focus on those as well. Uh, and that's really super important. So we really appreciate you bringing all those things to our attention. Um, I think now, Magdalena, if you could also provide some examples. Um, and I think we've pivoted, we're up in the global north now. And I think that we also need to focus on the global south and the issues that are faced there. Um, the worlds are quite different <laughs> for so many reasons. And I think that you're well placed to speak to um, civil society organizations and initiatives in the global south and build on what you were telling us before about the consultations that the CSIPM has done and your work and role in things um, related to that, including gender, uh, the right to food and all of those important uh, concerns. Yes, uh, thank you, Alison. Um, um, I think, yeah, the, the, the consultations have actually also provided you know, what, what you are mentioning, that prioritization also needs to be given now to countries on the global south uh, to put forward uh, their uh, demands, their analysis, the challenges they're facing. Um, and, and particularly for uh, any given transformation of food systems from the civil society uh, and indigenous people's side, what we have been seeing on the ground is that the agroecological pathway has been the response, uh, has been the response to transform uh, food systems because it is actually based on the agency of peasants, uh, of local food uh, producers, on indigenous peoples, their knowledge no? and the co-creation of this knowledge, the protection of biodiversity, uh, also um, 
a practice that does not rely on uh, external inputs, particularly chemical uh, fertilizers and uh, pesticides. Uh, so the agroecological pathway has been um, the, the key struggle for peoples uh, in the territories uh, to transform food systems and to challenge the agro-industrial uh, model uh, accompanied many times with also what we call uh, the false solutions no? uh, that often uh, continue with a violation of human rights such as uh, land grabbings. Um, and uh, this has been, uh, as I was saying, a, a key struggle that we have put forward also uh, in the Committee on World Food Security, but also uh, through other platforms uh, in the framework of the Conference of Parties for the CBD. In fact, the, the new framework, uh, the biodiversity framework, incorporates a target uh, that uh, promotes uh, the agroecological approaches. Uh, so um, this has been the, the, the systemic um, solution that is being proposed uh, from the territories, particularly from the, the Global South countries. Now, again, I would like to emphasize uh, the, the need to address some uh, global issues or, or let's say uh, uh, issues that need to be discussed at the international level. So as uh, for to provide the support to national governments and to ensure that uh, states fulfill their responsibilities on, on human rights and particularly their rights uh, to food. Um, to have these discussions uh, so as to eliminate the barriers for these states to, to promote public policies that go in support of, of the agroecological pathway. Uh, so, and if there's not uh, a coordination at the global level towards this direction, then it is also very difficult for national policies to support what is being uh, done on the ground. So um, demands need to come from the ground and go to the global level so as to shape, but then there's a need for, for, uh, for a coordination at the global level. What you mentioned at the beginning, Alison, the collaboration. Um, and these systemic issues that I was mentioning at the very beginning are very important to address because they have been actually uh, great barriers for the development, the advancement of the agroecological pathway. Um, so these this have been uh, um, the, the challenges, but also the responses we have seen uh, on, on the ground. Thanks, Magdalena, for that. Um, and to all of you for giving us really um, important examples and pathways forward um, that speak to both the opportunities that present themselves on the ground and what needs to happen uh, and what is happening um, internationally and um, at the global governance level. So I'm just trying to be mindful of time. I'm not very good at that. <laughs> but I think um, if we want to leave time for you to all have a, a chance to wrap up um, what you what you've said and provide us with some closing observations and insights. Uh, maybe what we'll do now is turn our um, attention to our amazing audience and ask them if they have any questions for you. So, um, I think the way the best way to do this maybe is for people to put their questions in the chat, and then as we see your questions, we can ask you to put those questions to the panel if that's all right, because that way the panel can see your question and also um, the panel can see you. Um, so uh, Miriam uh, Diaz Agave, um, if you have a question, is it possible for you to put it in the chat or would you rather just speak your question? What do you prefer? Well, I prefer, thank you very much for giving the opportunity. Um, I guess you may remember me, Miriam Diaz from Infalcosta in in Venezuela, in the also in the Rio Convention <laughs> and Mauritius. Um, I just wanted to um, point out something. We have been since 1992 trying to 
make these three conventions to work together. And I think what I can see of the panels, uh, we are going in that way. However, I have one a request. Uh, how can we think, seek for funds to implement mm. uh, the, the, this uh, convention? We have just a, a very small grant from the PPD, from, uh, from PNUD in Monte Cano, which was one of the examples of how we fight for biodiversity, but it's very small. So we try, we try to make people to go back to agroforestry, and they did. They have a special, very, very nice uh, project, but we only could involve 10 families. Mm. So my, my request is to seek for a little bit of more funding. Today in Venezuela, we are discussing a law to protect agave cocuy. Okay. Who is a, a very important uh, crop, uh, not just for making liquors, but also the food for them. And um, and also, uh, uh, how they live out of that. But however, we need money. We need resources so that we can implement uh, uh, whatever we have done there. I just wrote a manual of restoration of uh, uh, arid lands for fowl and I I want to implement that I will really like to to have uh, this implemented but need resources I'm sorry I am extending myself but uh, well I mean uh, it's very important this issue of fundings yeah you're absolutely right Miriam we can't go ahead communities can't go ahead if they don't have this support um, both funding and um, institutionally to do the work that needs to be done. And congratulations on your report for FAO. If you'd like to share that in the chat, we'd be happy uh, to make that available to people if it's uh, publicly available. Um, I don't know um, if anybody on the panel has would like to, to address uh, Miriam's question. Yeah, please, Miriam, go ahead. <laughs> I mean, I think, um, Miriam, I think you really nailed the, 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 how you say that? You nailed the, you, you, you hit the nail in the head. Uh, exactly. With the, lack, with the funding. Uh, it is a problem basically for everybody that is a developing country or that comes from a developing country party, as we call it in our jargon. Uh, we are now meeting, I mean, I'm, I am in the middle of a meeting on uh, the Intergovernmental Working Group on Drought, and uh, we have all these ideas but um, for from everyone, but then it comes down to how can we implement if we don't have enough funding. That was also the core of the conversation at the Climate COP on loss and damage, and the, what created this very hopeful uh, conversation on how is that going to be funded. And then Global Biodiversity Framework, thankfully, was born with the commitment to create a fund, at least. So, but what I think is, I, I would say, we don't have, we don't lack resources. I think we have two problems. One is the enormous fragmentation of efforts. So everybody is applying for grants, for mini grants, and there is no coherence from, and I don't think the coherence has to come from the implementers. The coherence has to come from the people who provide the grants and see how these grants can be better utilized. Um, the, the Global Environmental Facility actually is trying to do so. So they are now requesting governments to be very coherent and to and to tick boxes of many conventions, including the real conventions in their projects. And I think that is a, a step in the right direction. And then the other problem is, where is the money going? Because if we look at the pandemic, I mean, I am not criticizing, we needed to, we needed to fund the, the pandemic and the green rec and the recovery, post-pandemic recovery, but the trillions trickled in very, very quickly, which hasn't happened for the environment. And one can argue that the pandemic happened because we were not in balance with nature. So maybe we could we could save ourselves a lot of money by investing in the right uh, in the right things as a global community. So it is really a very a very difficult uh, problem. Uh, I think at, at 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 the local community level, I think pressure has to continue. Um, you you have to keep pressuring your 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 government that then goes to negotiate 
and that this has a relationship with these donors to, to bring more coherence. Final point, I don't know if you know about Barbados and the, the, the Prime Minister of Barbados and her initiative on the, I think it's called the Brighton Initiative to reform the Bretton Woods institutions. So it is about what is the World Bank going to fund? Yes. What, what type of projects? So I think that is the conversation that we really need to have. We have very little time for that, but that is what needs to happen quite, quite urgently. Well, I'm here, you know, I'm in, I have a, I'm from Infalcosta, the NGO that started all the fight for the convention of the certification and still we are here. And uh, well, uh, my experience, the, both academically and working with the communities, is that you order so that uh, we can try to find a way. I mean, it's amazing. Since 1991 up to, to 2023, we're still, still fighting for that. Very many, many thanks for listening. Thanks for your excellent question and for getting our questions started in such a, a, a fantastic way, Miriam. Um, we actually have a question from Adam Levine that I'm going to turn to now. Um, it's in the chat. Uh, this was sent to us before we got started with the webinar. So thanks, Adam. I see that you, I think you're on the call. Would you like to ask your question or would you like me to read it out for you? Uh, I see you've opened your video up. So over to you, Adam. Okay, there is a famous rock and roll singer who's named Adam Levine. I'm Alan Levine. But, oh, I'm uh, so sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Sorry, Alan. Happens Alice. all the time. Gets me to the front of the line for haircuts. Okay, um, there we go. Um, they get very excited. Um, you know, but I think actually, I don't remember exactly what I wrote, so please read it. Uh, but yeah. Okay, but sure. It's in the chat um, if you want to refer to it in a minute or whatever. Uh, um, the first question that um, Alan has is, uh, what does uh, the science say about claims that a massive shift to regenerative farming practices would be a major contributor to reducing carbon in our atmosphere. So um, I don't know, Magdalena, if that looks like a question for you or Robert or any of the, you're all, there's, I, what I love about this panel is it's so intersectional, it's amazing. Um, and then there's a follow-up question, um, assuming that you can confirm that these claims have um, validity, um, some validity, some validity at least, what do you see as the major impediments to adopting regenerative farming practices? So I guess this is a production focused question, Adam, uh, Alan, sorry. But what I would suggest is maybe as um, Magdalena was doing is opening it up to the broader um, agroecological movement as a regenerative social movement as well. And thinking maybe about that in a broader sense. So not just focusing on the production aspects, but on the more comprehensive kind of movement based, but great question, um, Alan, and thank if, you so much. And if I could say, like, I think the first part of the question, I am interested in the science because it's a really important claim. Okay, and good like, point. So yeah, okay, that's you know, a good and, point, and, thank and you. And one, you know, and, and one of the advocates for regenerative farming are, are making. But yes, then feel free to um, take it to the broader, uh, to, to the to the broader social sense. You know what? Because because though that's where the impediments may in fact lie. Okay, super. Thank you so much for your question and for sending it in advance. Much appreciated, um, Magdalena. Would you like to address that question, or should we uh, give it to someone else? No, no. I can start if uh, anyone else wants to jump in with any additions. Uh, yeah. Um, so, um, well, uh, regarding the, the science, um, of course, not the, the evidence, uh, the science and evidence based, uh, well, in this particular case for policymaking, uh, is, is extremely important, not to the direction of, of any kind of funding, um, we just need to be aware that this evidence uh, comes also from a broad uh, spectrum no? of, of, uh, of agents, of, of people, no? uh, and uh, not focused only on the, let's say, um, 
academia uh, spectrum, no? Because in fact, uh, in terms of, of food production, there's a broad knowledge uh, from indigenous peoples, from uh, the peasant communities, no? Uh, so they have been uh, real experiences, no? On uh, different practices and movement building, as you were saying also, Alison. Uh, in terms of uh, addressing climate change um, uh, through uh, climate change mitigation, but also adaptation no? in certain cases. Uh, also uh, in terms of, um, of biodiversity conservation and protection. Uh, now, in terms of uh, uh, um, for the agroecology, you know, that includes uh, regenerative uh, practices. Um, what I can say in terms of carbon is specifically the focus also on, on uh, the soil health, you know, uh, and uh, introducing, um, well, producing food uh, through a diversity of species uh, and not focusing on monoculture also has uh, had um important uh benefits for uh, soil health and uh, so then uh increasing uh carbon retention in soils no um a, a specific report that i can mention uh that has been um fundamental in this is the um, high level panel of experts uh, report uh, on uh, agroecological approaches uh, I can paste the link afterwards. And uh, there has also been um, an important document agreed by uh, member states, uh, always based on evidence and science, which is uh, the 10 elements of agroecology uh, of uh, the FAO. No? Um, so these are important instruments that in a way, um, uh document uh, at the international level what the experiences uh, have demonstrated to uh, bring benefits uh to uh the soil uh to biodiversity but also to uh the the local communities in terms of, of food and health no um so yeah i would stop here um i can add more if needed <laughs> Thanks, Magdalena. Um, Robert or Miriam, would you like to address either of the questions that we've had so far? I didn't mean to shut you out from the first question. You're okay, Miriam? Or you Just have something you'd like to add? Super quickly. Um, yeah. uh, yes, the We're evidence, not in a rush. <laughs> the evidence is there. Yep. Uh, agro regenerative farming would mean a major improvement for many, it could trickle down so many benefits and go to the fulfillment of so many sustainable development goals is not even, it's a no brainer. So then the question is why not? What are we doing? Well, I mean, I guess the answer is there is, as, as Magdalena said at the beginning, we have this agro-industrial uh, sector that is very powerful that perpetrates these practices. On the side of governments, uh, what, what we advocate for at the UNCCD is to revise to really pay attention to the subsidies that governments are giving to these companies and to the incentives they give to the to the farmers and to and to and to small farmers. Um, not easy, but uh, it definitely uh, it's almost a no brainer to to start trying to move in that direction. Excellent points, Magdalena. Thanks so much. Oh, sorry. Miriam, my bad. <laughs> We're having a name uh, salad going on today. Uh, Robert, do you have anything that you'd like to add? To, uh, or... just yeah, so just to say that I've seen this type of farming in practice on a small scale, and, and it is astonishing in terms of it, it's a, there are means of farming, and it's not just one type. There's various uh, combinations of practices that can achieve this, and and one of the key things is they need to be context specific to the environment in which you know the agriculture is happening. But the, in terms of building up soil carbon, yes, uh, it it can be done and should be done. It's just in terms of if you think about soil carbon as sort of a, a bank deposit that we don't want to draw down, but also just in terms of the number of calories per hectare that are possible on uh, these regenerative style uh, farming practices and not just 
volume of calories, but the nutrition level of those calories can be quite astonishing. Um, the challenge is to scale it up, it, especially in Western countries, uh, high income countries, uh, given the current economic model, right? Because uh, regenerative, regenerative farming is, is knowledge intensive, both in terms of, you know, how to grow crops, how to manage land, animal husbandry, and so on. Um, and, um, it, you know, it doesn't match well our system that we've set up in, in North America, where we just want to generate as many cheap calories of any kind as possible uh, using fossil fuels and a minimum of labor, right? So that we can facilitate drive through lineups at Tim Hortons with low quality coffee, cheap, cheap, greasy food for under $7 a combo, right? That's what our food model is right now. And so regenerative farming doesn't fit into that. So it, it is a broader systems approach, which is, um, and of course, as was mentioned, paying shareholders in grocery stores, in ag industry, and so on, we have to, our model right now is focused on giving them dividends and profits, right? And so it's, it's I'd like to say there's an easy way that we can scale regenerative farming up from the smaller scale to the broader scale, but there's going to be a lot of resistance along the way for sure. Resistance is for sure. I think uh, we can all acknowledge that that's what that's the structural reform and the uh, the solution that I think we're all looking for. Magdalena. Yeah, just maybe to add uh, on uh, following up on Robert's comments, I think um, one of the 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 important or the key principle of the agroecological pathway is also the, the, the um, as you mentioned, Alison, not the, the movements and, and the political um, direction it offers, no? And it puts in question also uh, the power asymmetries that exist. So it is, it contains, um, a bunch of experience, experiences that are adapted to the local context based on the co-creation of knowledge, but it also puts into questions these power asymmetries and these systemic uh, barriers that uh, you mentioned, Robert, now how the economic model is shaped. Because we also have experiences uh, from the US, from Canada on agroecological uh, based uh, food productions and they are, uh, constantly facing uh, these type of challenges, not on power asymmetry. So it is a struggle that is important on the social and political uh, uh, level, um, as so not so much to only focus on practices, but go through a systemic transformation of, of the food systems. Thanks, Magdalena. Miriam, I see you. Um, I just want to go to, I think it was Roger. I see a red uh, square and I believe you had a question perhaps, but your hand was up. Is Was that intentional or not? Yes, my hand is up because I'm not sure whether I want to make a comment or ask a question. It's a sort of a combination thing, really, because mm -hmm. when I was looking at the um, blurb about the event, it talked mm -hmm. about it being 32 years now, 31 years now since Rio, and that the situation that the world is facing is worse than it was then. Mm. And I'm, I find that very depressing because it really confirms what I've thought. And so I was very pleased that Robert McLayman was talking about some of the things that give us cause for optimism, although I think he's more optimistic than I am. I'd quite like to have a little list of those things because I'd like to be able to use them in my conversations with friends. But I think the thing that troubles me is that I regard myself as being reasonably well informed as a complete uh, bystander in all these things. I have no professional involvement at all. But um, there's an amazing amount of information out there that we have great difficulty is in, so to speak, ordinary people in getting to grips with. I mean, for example, I had never heard until this afternoon of the UNCCD, and I'm appalled at that because it's been going on for years. And um, but I'm aware of the other some of these other entities that are going on, the COP26, 27, and COP15, and all these things. But I, I just really wonder. I mean, we know what the problem is. We even know what the solution is, but it's how to 
generate any how to energize not just um, ordinary people but governments i mean everybody talks enthusiastically about what needs to be done but we'd actually do anything i mean i i, I mean i i've talked to a number of my friends who are reasonably well educated people and i can't even energize them sufficiently to write to their parliamentary representatives to to, to do something i mean I think it's such a complicated problem that in one sense it's very easy, but trying to energise people is very difficult. And if anybody's got any ideas about how I can even energise my friends, let alone energise the Russian government or the Indian government or the Chinese government, I'd be interested in ideas. But if Robert McLean would be able to put into the chat those that little list of reasons for being optimism, I'm very grateful. Thank you. Well, thank you for your question, Roger. I think it is. Um, I, I, I all I see is an R. Um, and just for your information and for everybody's information, this webinar will be available on YouTube, so you can watch it once we're done, and it's posted as many times as you want. So um, it would be great though if Robert could summarize his points and put them in the chat though before we log off, if you have time. And also, Robert, I think that's a direct question to you. So over to you. Okay, yes. Uh, thank you, Roger. And if I did seem overly optimistic, I was thinking about George Bush in 1990, uh, 1991 or thereabouts. He was famous for saying about a thousand points of light and talking about the, the benefits of civil society, the first George Bush presidency. So I was trying to point out some, some points of light. At the same time, I am quite cognizant that the need to act on biodiversity loss, on greenhouse gas emissions, on the impacts of climate change, on uh, the food crises in low-income countries. It's never been more urgent than now. And you're right, despite you know the, the, the glass half full is that we're still working on these challenges. The glass half empty is that we still haven't made enough progress on them. Um, and I don't want to sound like Jane Jacobs, one of the last books that she wrote before she passed away was called Dark Age Ahead. Um, and it, it was quite a glum, grim uh, forecast of the future from someone who had worked on urban sustainability all her life. And so I'm I'm resisting that challenge uh, to, to fall into despair because I do feel that the opportunity still exists. The time the clock is very much ticking. Uh, and we do we have sort of lapsed into a new Cold War with the, the invasion of Ukraine by Russia and the saber rattling between China and the United States. But at the same time, if we can keep people around the table talking and following up on these commitments that we're making. And loss and damage is, uh, was mentioned, uh, I think, by Miriam earlier. Um, you know, we have this recognition that it's probably too late to avoid the worst impacts of climate change. So now we have to think about adaptation uh, of, of societies, of cities, of food systems. And we need to compensate low-income countries for the fact that they are on the front end of the impacts. If we can actually, I think this next 10 years is critical. Um, that this is when we need to, you know, the, the window is still open, but it's shutting in terms of collective action. Um, and the final thing I would say is that a, uh, something that David Suzuki uh, is big on is the wisdom of the elders and trying to mobilize that uh, in the context of, of the fight for a, a greener, cleaner society. Um, and so I think for all generations, it's not just the Greta Thunbergs, it's also the, the older generations and those of us who are uh, still in the heart of our working careers, we need to do this. And the, my final observation is that in the UK, just in the last week, um, there's a, a famous soccer personality, football personality named Gary Lineker. He hosts a, a, a weekly highlight show on uh, the BBC about soccer. That's what he does. But on Twitter, he tweeted that he was not happy with the UK's um, policies on asylum seekers, that they want to shut it down. And he tweeted that he thought it was wrong and that the rhetoric being used by the government reminded him of 1930s Germany. It caused a storm. He immediately lost his position at the UK, uh, at the BBC. He was suspended. But what was interesting was that the soccer watching community in the UK was galvanized to push back and to confront the government over its asylum policies and wanting to make them more draconian. And so this is, I think, what we need as a society is that the people who are in the drive through getting Tim Horton's coffee and donuts right now, who are shuttling kids to piano practices or hockey practices, to folks who are going to play pickleball, 
uh, at the rec center, to folks who are meeting for coffee at, at, at McDonald's, they need to have these conversations too, these environmental conversations. And if we can get everybody talking about this, maybe that's where we start to ratchet up pressure on politicians. Sorry for the the diatribe there, but no problem. Thank you, Thanks, Roger. Bro. And I'll put a few ideas in the in the chat too. Thank you Thank for you. that. Thanks, Robert, um, and thanks, Roger, for those great uh, questions and responses. Um, I think what we're going to do now is, uh, Miriam, I see that you've put a link uh, to some work that you've done into the chat, so thank you for that. Um, did you also have a comment that you wanted to share or another question? And if you do, please uh, make it... Just a little, just a little bit. Uh, when okay. you're talking about gener regenerative form. I would like to uh, you know, emphasize that we have to try to rescue pre-Columbia, at least in Venezuela and in the Americas, pre-Columbian techniques. It's very difficult when you ask for a grant and you want that to come back. Uh, uh, the, you know, people want to see potatoes, whatever. Here, we have just rescue maize from Paraguaná Peninsula in Venezuela, which I even didn't know existed, small, very small maize. But the, the custom, they, they, I respect them because they, they plant maize with a bean together. I was amazed. And uh, you know, I have a PhD from Cambridge, whatever, but then I, I think it's very important that we respect and try to involve more anthropologists to bring up all of these antique techniques. Thank you. Absolutely. We actually have a project in Brazil around the traditional Urba Mate system um, as an agroforestry project uh, through the UNESCO chair and the Laurier Center. And uh, we do have an anthropologist leading that team, working with an agronomist. So it's a wonderful combination of knowledges and they're uh, valuing the traditional knowledges of the people's um, in that area. So uh, I appreciate that point, Miriam, very much. I think based on time, um, if I ask our panelists uh, to provide us with maybe two or three minutes of wrap up insights about your takeaways from the conversation that we've had today, that would be great. Um, perhaps uh, if we go with Miriam and then Magdalena and then Robert, um, is that a good order? Okay, over to you. Very, very happy to. Um, I mean, I probably would have had a different set of remarks if Roger had not spoken. Um, I do have to admit that I I work on these issues every single day. And I find it, I will be very, very honest with you, I find it terribly hard to remain optimistic. Um, I try and I go over the bright spots and then I, I rejoice myself in the little in the little um, uh, battles that are won. But we are definitely very far away from reaching the point where we can actually adapt. And uh, I think Robert already said it. Uh, this is irreversible. Uh, we we cannot. I mean, the train is gone, um, uh, but but we uh, we still have time to have more or less to cope with the consequences more or less. Um, I would say what inspires me is um, basically human ingenuity. Uh, Robert just wrote something on green hydrogen. I I, I think the 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 ingenuity and the and the optimism of many many people and the determination of many people actually are what are going to make the difference and then you can think about some countries some 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 states people that are leaders uh, worldwide that you can kind of kind of look up to them. I mean, for example, Costa Rica, which is a very, it's very interesting. They have fully decarbonized. They have these very good um, uh, schemes for uh, payment for environmental services, et cetera. But there are others that are as well doing things um, um, that are very, very commendable and that are worth replicating and scaling up. And then also the social movements, uh, which at the end of the day, I mean, in the case of Germany, my secretariat is based in, in Bonn, Germany. And we saw how Fridays for Future had a huge impact in the election, in the current government, because there is a coalition with the Green Party that 
wasn't, uh, 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 um, I mean, yes, they had more advanced uh, policies than many other countries, but they were not at the point where they are now, like, and still, still with a lot of controversy. So you also see the social movement, and then you see the scientists and the people who are developing technology uh, and the indigenous peoples who have this wisdom. So I think that is what, um, what really uh, can can bring us to a different uh, to a different harbor is to really look look inward to human ingenuity to reconcile ourselves with nature and then to try to move forward in a different with a different mindset. Thank you for those closing observations, Miriam. That's really appreciated. Um, Robert, or sorry, Magdalena. My bad. <laughs> Um, yes, uh, thank you, Alison. Well, I, I don't have uh, much to add at this point. Um, I agree a bit with uh, Miriam's analysis uh, on, on the current uh, status uh, we are at, but uh, again, to not reinforce uh, the, the call for um, a multilateral and democratic uh, based uh, governance, no? uh, particularly uh, well on, on, on global food governance, uh, but really uh, keep the focus on, um, on what is already there and that is based on uh, the human rights framework, no? such as the UN Committee on World Food Security. Um, which clearly distinguishes you not know, the roles and responsibilities uh, of the different actors uh, in the discussions, in the debates, uh, in the platforms, but also acknowledges you not know, the different uh, power imbalances that are at play. So, really, a call uh, for uh, continuing and uh, keep fighting for what. Uh, the UN has uh, has uh, has advanced on uh, on the multilateral and democratic uh, based uh, governance at the global level. Um, so yeah, I would close uh, with that. Thanks, Magdalena. And I also point, uh, as you had been doing before, back to the uh, global biodiversity framework out of COP fifteen, and. Um, and just reiterate the emphasis on mentioning human rights agreements uh, within the, um, the framing goals, but also uh, the direct reference to the UN DRIP agreement. Um, and I think that that's really an important cross-referential thing that came out of that, that, that those meetings as well. So um, slow progress, maybe not fast enough, but some things are happening. <laughs> so thanks, thanks for those closing comments. Much appreciated. Uh, Mir uh, Robert, we'll give you the last word, please. Well, I hope, Allison, you get the last word, but um, I'll just quickly say that um, it's been a wonderful conversation. I've really enjoyed uh, the discussion from the interventions from my fellow panelists and from the, the other people who pose some really challenging questions for us. Um, I'm a big believer in multilateralism, um, and, uh, you know, it's it, it's the only way forward, right? Because these problems cannot be solved in any other way except in a multilateral context. I hope that when we have this uh, event again in 2052 or 2053, that we've made tremendous progress on implementing uh, these conventions. And it's sort of like we're having a, a few drinks and celebrating all of the victories. Um, but there's a lot of hard work to do, obviously, between now and then. But I think we are at that moment, as I said to Roger earlier, the next decade or so, we've hit the transition point where technologically, economically, and even in terms of the policy tools that we need to make the transition to a cleaner, greener society, everything's in place now. Young people want it. And ultimately, we're talking about their future over the next 30 to 50 years. Um, so the, the moment is ripe. I hope that we all sort of follow through on taking advantage of this opportunity. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll just give it back to you, Allison. Thank you for having me. Oh, thanks for joining in. This has been a really fruitful conversation. And I think that um, you've made the points together, speaking to each other as well uh, throughout the panel about the really and the important um, need to continue these uh, synergistic and systems wide uh, conversations um, and why multilateral 
governance at the global level and institutions at the global level are so important, but also um, that there are solutions on the ground um, to make these changes happen. And we need to connect those two to enable um, the future that we need for people and the planet. Uh, and I also um, think that that we're we have this window. I think, as Robert said, the window is closing. Also, as Robert said, but um, I think that there are um, there are spaces still where we can make uh, the changes that we need, and I think that's why these conversations are really important. Uh, and I think that um, I applaud the work that you're all doing, and that everybody on the call, I'm sure, is contributing to in their own way. Um, and that I think that that's that that's where we have our power, right, is to push back against the existing systems that have gotten us into this circumstance in the first place. And as I like to tell my students, we got ourselves into this set of circumstances and we have the tools to get ourselves out. So it's a question of moving forward in a really deliberate way to make the changes happen. And I think that one of the things that's, um, that is that is really important going forward is having the conversations more explicitly and, and respectfully between the global north and the global south. I think that there needs to be in the same way now that we're starting to put indigenous knowledge on the same footing with scientific knowledge. I mean, we're still quite a ways from making that happen, but I think there also needs to be the recognition that the solutions really, especially for food systems and um, dealing with desertification, a lot of those solutions are in the global south and we need to give those countries the tools to make those changes happen. And um, as Miriam, um, our, our audience participant um, indicated that requires funding. And I think the, uh, the UNFCC, uh, or sorry, the uh, COP27 agreement really points to, I mean, that's much less than than perfect, the agreement that was struck there, but it is at least a, a step in the right direction. So thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. Uh, thanks to our panelists for your wisdom and your guidance. Um, it's been really amazing to have you all together to to speak to these important issues. And thanks also to um, Amanda and to Erica, for enabling all the technology that happened in the background and, and letting us have this space where we could speak together. And also thank you to our audience. Um, thank you for your uh, your really, uh, your, your insightful questions that pushed us to think about things that we otherwise wouldn't have considered and for being such active listeners. And also um, really, really um, glad to be able to offer the webinar uh, as a recording on YouTube. So we'll let everybody uh, that we can know about that when it's available. So thanks to everyone. Have a, uh, a really great rest of your day, wherever you are. And uh, we'll see you again soon, hopefully. Thanks. <laughs>